All right, so I'd like to uh, quickly run through this uh, presentation as an accompaniment to uh, the previous Chapter 22 materials to uh, run through specific examples of evidence for uh, evolution. So um, certainly all sorts of uh, reasons uh, for evolution and ways to identify evolution. Uh, so again, uh, stuff to look at here uh, is trying to get a sense of why populations uh, would evolve and what evidence we have for that. Now, uh, things to, to note uh, is that science is a, a sort of a unique endeavor uh, because it has certain requirements uh, for sort of modifying our understanding. Uh, first of all, uh, a key feature of science is that it needs to be uh, falsifiable. Uh, the idea being that nothing can ever be proven uh, because uh, for science to be sort of tentative and open to change, uh, ideas need to be uh, readily falsified. So. Um, we can only focus on ideas that can uh, be disproved. We'd never say an idea is proved that it's only uh, supported or it has a, an abundance of support. Uh, but ideas are, in science are tentative uh, and certainly falsifiable. Now, uh, we also need to differentiate between uh, the terms theory and hypothesis. So hypothesis uh, is, again, a, a tentative uh, explanation uh, of uh, some sort of phenomenon. Now a theory though uh, has had uh, significant empirical support uh, and in addition to that uh, it can sort of allow us to make sort of uh, reliable decisions. Okay? So you know talking about evolution as a theory actually carries considerable weight. Uh, let's see, again uh, it's a theory. All right, so uh, we see all sorts of evidence for evolution uh, in the fossil record. Uh, there are, again, uh, going back at, to other examples, uh, transitional species, uh, extinct species that are obviously uh, related to those that uh, are in existence today. Uh, and what that does is give us a sense of uh, these changes that have occurred, uh, in particular uh, lineages of organisms over time. Uh, this Proto-Lindinia witty uh, is a nice example uh, as well. Uh, looks like a dragonfly, but it has a wingspan of approximately three feet. So, uh, again, uh, supporting the idea that life has changed over time. Uh, we have Tiktaalik, again that uh, transitional fossil, looking at the switch from uh, fish to these tetrapods, these land organisms. Uh, Archaeopteryx is another cool example. Uh, dinosaur with feathers. So uh, again, uh, sort of a transitional species. Oops. Uh, let's see, Lucy is a, a quite famous uh, organism. She lived, oh, I want to say five, six, seven million years ago, and uh, is an upright organism. You can tell by the shape of her uh, spine and pelvis uh, and her leg bones uh, that uh, she was an upright organism, uh, but uh, it had the skull that uh, is transitional from other primates to uh, something that tends to be more homo-like or, or human-like. Uh, let's see, cetaceans, again, we can look at the uh, transition from uh, land organisms to uh, these uh, mammals that live uh, in the oceans. So uh, again, you can see their relationship by looking at the uh, structures that uh, remain in them. You, know, you can see their relationship to other um, ungulates or even toad animals. Uh, so again, we can take what we know about the uh, geological changes that have occurred over time and then we can see uh, transitions that have occurred uh, with different forms of life uh, that have arisen as the earth has changed. Uh, let's see, we've talked about homologous structures before. The idea being that uh, shared ancestry leads to shared patterns of uh, anatomical structure. So uh, you can take this sort of primitive form uh, with uh, the upper extremities of a human and see the relationship between this form and other organisms. Uh, you can also see this in the uh, mouth parts of uh, certain um, arthropods. Now let's see, we have the uh, similarity in skeleton of some of the uh, members of the great ape family. And uh, again, we see the changes uh, that have occurred uh, in organisms uh, as they've transitioned from, uh, in this case, um, land animals to aquatic animals or marine animals. Now a vestigial organ, uh, like, they one, like the one mentioned here, uh, is again uh, sort of a remnant uh, of the past. Uh, it was useful in uh, 
ancestor species but has lost its uh, function. Now again, if um, the structure no longer serves a, a useful purpose but doesn't, isn't selected against uh, by natural selection, um, mutations or deleterious mutations, harmful mutations, can accumulate over time and uh, reduce the uh, usefulness of that structure until the point where it's uh, little is left. Uh, now, analogous structures are uh, a bit misleading. Uh, analogous structures uh, show convergent evolution, the idea being that uh, different species that are not closely related converge on the same um, resolution or adaptation. Uh, you can see some of the striking similarities between the eyes of uh, a human and an octopus. Octopi have uh, very well-developed uh, eyesight um, as predators, you know, it's a useful feature. Uh, but uh, they do have definite uh, differences in the terms of uh, the structure of the eye, and uh, they arose, you know, their eyes uh, arose independently from those uh, of um, modern humans. Uh, additionally, wings are probably the classic example uh, of analogous structures. You know, lots of different lines of organisms have uh, developed wings independently of one another. Uh, reason being, uh, if you're able to fly away and fly towards prey, fly away from predators and fly towards prey, it's a, a huge advantage. Uh, let's see. And uh, again, um, recall that uh, cetaceans like dolphins. Um, evolved from land animals. So fish were already in the water and evolved into uh, sharks, but here you have these land animals uh, move back into the water secondarily. Um, so they uh, arose at the same conclusion, independent of one another. Uh, let's see, we talked about vestigial organs being uh, those organs that uh, are used or remain after uh, evolution has you know, structurally changed uh, the organism. Um, the human appendix uh, has frequently been referred to as uh, vestigial, but it does have a role in uh, embryonic development and does have uh, some immune function. So, yeah, it's got a little bit of function left. Uh, goosebumps are an interesting example. Um, Nonverbal communication, uh, certainly significant with animals, and uh, one way in which animals can communicate with one another is by raising hackles or having their hair stand on end. Um, another way to uh, effect change in the body is also to have uh, erector pili muscles, which uh, can constrict and cause hairs to loft. Uh, lofting hair uh, can trap heat. Uh, so lofting hair creates uh, more still air, and more still air uh, creates a layer of insulation, and that allows an organism to uh, trap heat. Well, obviously humans have much reduced uh, body hair, uh, but we have retained uh, this uh, erector pilus muscle and um, the uh, reflexive reaction to have uh, that muscle contract and cause hairs to stand up. So it doesn't help warm us, uh, but it can uh, be uh, a response to uh, various stimuli, whether it's cold or fear. And close-ups. All right, uh, comparative embryology, again, allows us to uh, look at relationships between species. Um, certainly, uh, genes are shared by all organisms, and those genes that lay out basic body plans uh, are shared by many organisms. So uh, it makes sense that as embryos, when these uh, genes affecting the layout of body plans are um, functioning, uh, that organisms will resemble one another. Uh, like these pharyngeal uh, gill slits or pouches uh, are seen in different organisms. Uh, they can become gills in fish uh, or will modify into portions of the jaw for uh, different organisms. Uh, let's see, post anal tail, obvious uh, in some organisms, but in organisms like us, uh, our tail is quite reduced. It's just the end of your little tailbone, your coccyx. There we go. Uh, let's see, certainly all life shares this code. Uh, all life has some same basic materials, uh, like the cell membrane, like ribosomes. So if we use the same information, if we have some of the same genes, uh, if we have uh, some of the basic machinery uh, in common with one another, it's highly suggested that all life is related and that over time these changes have accrued. Uh, let's see. Now what's neat is that uh, you can take you know, anatomical features and try and create these trees of uh, development or these patterns of development uh, between species, uh, but you can also look at similarities in DNA sequence. Uh, and in doing so, you can uh, determine the fact that you know, more closely related species are going to have more DNA in common with one another. Um, if you use the example, let me find a little space here. 
uh, you know, if you use the example of uh, a family, you know, we can use uh, my family as an example here. Um, we had Ed and Lois, my grandparents, had some kids. They had Sandy, who married Mike. Uh, they had Becky, who married Muhammad. Uh, let's see, they had Amy and Sarah, they had twins, and uh, those are their four daughters. Now, Mike and Sandy had some kids, Paul, Pete, and John, my bros. Uh, Becky Muhammad had two girls, Miriam and Noel. And Amy and Sarah haven't had any kids. Now, uh, my brothers and I share about 50% uh, of our DNA in common with one another. Uh, we have less DNA in common with uh, Miriam and Noel. Now, who connects us? Well, our common ancestor, right? So, Miriam and I are related to one another, uh, but it's not like one evolved from the other. It's that we share this common ancestor. And the more recently organisms uh, have split from a common ancestor, the more DNA they have in common with one another. So I may have maybe about one-eighth of my DNA in common with uh, Miriam, uh, but my mom uh, and Becky have about 50% uh, of their DNA in common with one another. So as the generations progress, uh, organisms uh, within this group uh, have less and less of their DNA in common with one another. Uh, but again, what connects them is this common ancestor, and over time, you know, certainly uh, life changes. So that reviews that. Uh, then that goes back to this uh, DNA chart looking at uh, similarity. So obviously Homo sapiens uh, are more closely related to Pan, it's the, the chimps, uh, than some of the other organisms. So we have more DNA in common with one another. Uh, and again, it sort of shows the basic breaks uh, in life. Uh, so, uh, looking at entire genomes or chromosomes, uh, again, uh, we look at the relationship between uh, humans. We have the human genome and uh, our relationship with uh, the chimps. And again, it's the second chromosome uh, in humans. We have one fewer chromosomes in chimps. And what we realized uh, in looking at these chromosomes, the banding patterns of the chromosomes, is that in chimps, uh, or an, an ancestor uh, that was shared by humans and chimps, uh, our second chromosome and their extra chromosome fused with one another to create this long second human chromosome. So genetically, we are sort of startlingly uh, similar to chimpanzees. Oh, uh, interesting side note. Um, the genes that control uh, the number of or rounds of cell division uh, and the development of the uh, neurons in the brain, um, humans and chimps differ by, I think, one or two rounds of cell division. So uh, in terms of number of neurons uh, in our brain, uh, we don't, we, the numbers are you know, quite different because it's like 26 or 27 rounds of cell division, uh, but the number of rounds of cell division is quite similar. So again, small changes in genotype can have uh, significant phenotype, phenotypic impacts. Uh, let's see, artificial selection, that's a big point that Darwin made. Uh, again, humans can change uh, characteristics of organisms very easily. Uh, and in relatively short order, and uh, nature can certainly do the same as well. Uh, corn on the cob, or sweet corn, is another great example. Uh, teosinte is a, a corn uh, native to uh, Mexico, and uh, what people had done centuries ago was take some corn that had mutations, had some external kernels uh, that they liked, planted those kernels, and then eventually were able to develop uh, corn that we're familiar with today. Uh, and certainly all the work that's been done with all the different breeds of uh, cats and dogs uh, reflect the impact of humans. And um, we'll pause at that point.